All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Let's grab our Bibles, gang. Let's turn to Romans. We're going to continue our study of Romans. Pick up where we left off last Sunday. You know, uh, Romans, this book is so incredible because it takes the gospel, the gospel message, salvation, and it takes all aspects of it, all parts of the gospel, and it sort of like stretches it out. So we have this, all this breadth, but it also stretches it down, and we have the breadth of it. And so, you know, the gospel, of course, it's, we all know what that means. It's the good news. Um, and the, the gospel is the message that defines all of the aspects of salvation. So it's not just how we get saved, right, how we respond to God, but it's also how we live. It's also how we live by the power of God. Amen? And so Romans takes all of this and it stretches it out and it widens it, puts a deeper you know, magnifying glass, if you will, a deeper lens on it. So, with that in mind, we have Romans chapters 1 through 3. So we have this first section of Romans. And what we have here is the first element of the gospel, which is man's sin. Okay, it's, it's man's dilemma because of our sin nature, our problem with sin. Now this is a, a very, very important aspect of salvation, but this is also a part that a lot of folks leave out. Um, it's not pleasant to, to talk about this. It's not popular to talk about sin. It's not popular. You know, you're not going to win any popularity contests by starting the gospel out with the wrath of God as against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of, of man. And yet, it is critical that we start here, guys. Um, I've told you this time and again. In order to truly understand how glorious salvation in Christ is, we must understand first what we're saved from. Right? If you, if you don't know what you're saved from, then what's the point of being saved? And so, Paul starts here where, where he should start. And that is, the, he starts with the bad news, and then the good news seems a lot better news, right? Seems really, really good news. So, what does he do? Well, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, here's what he, he says. This is sort of the beginning of the gospel presentation. And he says, Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So he begins by saying, the wrath of God is against all of our ungodliness, all of our unrighteousness. Righteousness means to be right with God. So unrighteousness means to be unright with God. And why are we unright with God? Because of our sin. And so he's elaborating then on this condition, this state, this nature of sinners that each one of us is born uh, rebellious against the Lord. And what he's doing is he's describing this to a few groups of people. And that's what Romans 1 through 3 is all about. So it's as if we have different groups kind of raising their hand and saying, well, wait a minute. Yeah, the wrath of God is against, you know, uh, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. But surely we're not in that group, right? I mean, we're okay. We're, we're not under God's wrath. And Paul says, no, you are under God's wrath. And then somebody else over here, well, wait a minute, but not us, right? We're not un under the wrath of God. And he says, yeah, actually you are too. He starts out, and we saw this a couple of Sundays ago, in Romans 1, 19 through 32, with the pagans, right? The lost Gentiles, those who have no historical tie back or uh, heritage tie back to the God of Israel. But he starts with this group, and they don't care. So what makes them kind of unique is that they could care less that they are without God and under His wrath. I mean, they, we saw this last time. Um, they, it says, des it describes them as those who are wise in their own eyes. Those who see their Creator, they see His attributes. They see it without, right, the creation. They see it as a creator. They have it imprinted in their hearts, and yet they deny him. And rather than worship the creator, they worship his creation instead. It says they've, they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they neither worship God, nor are they thankful to God, and they've given themselves over to their own sinful lusts. And what does God do? Well, he hands them over to that. So this is a group, this initial group, they really don't care that they're under the wrath of God. But then we come to chapter 2, and this is where we started last week. 
This is a different group, and these are the people that would say they absolutely care. But they are the moralists. The moralists. Um, by the way, later on in chapter 2, Paul's going to speak to the Jews. And then, just in case um, anybody else raises their hand and says, what about us? He's just going to end in chapter 3, this section. He'll say, look, all mankind. <laughs> Everybody is under the wrath. And that's really the point of all of this in this first section is that no one is exempt. No one is exempt from their need for salvation in Christ. Even those good people. Even people who live by a code of moralism or ethics. Religious people. Doesn't matter. We are all under the wrath of God and in need of salvation. And so that's where we land in chapter 2 are the moralists. These are people that would say they're okay because of their morality. Um, so, before we go any further, gang, we're going to kind of review what we went through last week, and then we're going to keep going forward. I'll just tell you before we pray. Guys, you know, uh, last week after the message, I just, I, I felt that, that emotional feeling of, oh, that wasn't easy. And I kind of looked into your eyes, and a few of you were kind of looked like, ah, oh, that wasn't easy. You know, the gospel message is one that is not supposed to be easy. No matter what churches will tell you, that easy believism, just add Jesus to your life, and it'll make it all okay. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't adding Jesus to your life, beloved. It's making Jesus your life. Amen? And so in order for us to really understand this, we've got to go to the depths that Romans takes us about our sin. So buckle up, hang in there, and let's see what the Holy Spirit has for us today. Amen? Pray with me, guys. Lord, that's our prayer. Our prayer is that, Holy Spirit, this is your pulpit, and you would take it and take these notes and take these verses and say what has to be said. God, you know... Everybody who's listening to this message, whether that's in person right now or later on in recording, God, you know our weaknesses, you know our troubles, you know our shortcomings. You also know all the victories that we've had in you. And we, God, we just, we know, Lord, that through thick and thin, up and down in this planet, the only answer is you. So God... Here it is. Here we are. We present our hearts to you right now. We present our minds to you right now. And we say in a powerful and passionate way, deliver this truth to us. We do not want to be ones who suppress the truth. We do not want to be ones who deny it, hide it, rationalize it away. God, we want to own it and live by it. And I know that our church family is, uh, is going through some stuff right now. And it's very easy to get knocked off the, the course. Father, we pray that this morning you would put us right back on, right back on the path. And we say this to you and ask these things in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's okay. Just let it go. Sorry. Right. That's probably God calling. We just need to. <laughs> go ahead. Do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, it might be a phone call left here like yesterday or something. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, focus on me right now. <laughs> Who are the moralists? Who are the moralists? All right. Well, we got through verse 5 last time. We're going to try to get through verse 10 today. All right. The moralist is somebody who would look at... Romans chapter 1 and these people there and they would say oh man good thing I'm not on that list I am better than they are so it's people who aren't overtly pagan sinner, sinners and they have it in them to say because I'm not like that group I'm not the sinner that they are I'm not a murderer not an adulterer not a fornicator or whatever is on the list or even closer to home, something like, you know, I believe in God. I go to church. I work hard. Uh, I'm nice to people. Well, most people. But even on the worst days, I am better than those wretches in Romans chapter 1. 
See, the moralist, as we saw last week, condemns the pagans in their hearts because they see themselves as good and decent people. And what Paul is pointing out here is that is a big problem. It's a big problem when the moralist has that sort of outlook and perspective and view of themselves because here's the deal. Just because someone is moral does not mean they're necessarily saved. Beloved, moralism does not save you. So just because somebody is of good moral fiber, good character, hardworking, uh, has a code of ethics, a religion, whatever, um, it does not necessarily mean that they're in Christ. People who aren't overtly pagan, um, but they have this sort of external morality. I think we could, it's fair to say we can call these, because uh, there's a lot of these folks in, in, that go to churches. So there's a lot of Christian people, right? Professing Christians. By the way, who was Paul writing this letter to? He wasn't writing it to the world. He was writing it to the church in Rome. So he's... Apparently, we can probably say for sure, that inside this church, there are some people who profess faith in Christ. Maybe they have a connection to this Christian moral value system of theirs that they've externally kind of placed in their lives. And so they think because externally they're very Christian, that because of that, that they're okay. But beloved, that's not true. Paul is pointing this out profoundly. So what are the moralists guilty of? And by the way, what are all of us guilty of? Now, last week, we started this list, and that's what we see in the text. We started this list with, number one, self-righteousness. So if you're taking notes, that's top of the list. The moralist is guilty of self-righteousness. Look at verses 1 and 2. So everybody in Romans chapter 2? Verse 1, Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who practice the same things, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. It's self-righteousness, guys. It's a self-righteous thing to look at another sinner, for one sinner to look at another sinner and say, I'm better than you. And I condemn you in my heart. The word condemn means literally to judge or to send one to hell. It's a self-righteous thing. Uh, that's God's job, by the way. Judgment is God's job alone. And it's a sin of idolatry when we are self-righteous towards another. So, I told you this last week. It's the condemned condemning the condemned. Right? It's just the morally condemned <laughs> condemning the overtly condemned. Along with that, though, is number two. If you're taking notes, here's your second thing. It's hypocrisy. What is the moralist guilty of? Hypocrisy. Look at verse 3. But do you suppose this, O man, that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So we looked at this last time, and I'm not going to reteach it, but I took you to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 21 22, and we looked at how Jesus said, maybe you haven't committed murder outwardly, but you sure have committed it inwardly in your heart. And then down in verse 27, 28, he says, you may have not committed adultery outwardly, but you sure have committed it inwardly. And that's the thing, is that it's hypocritical for anyone to look at another person and say, well, they sin that way, I don't sin that way, because we all do. The scripture says that we all have sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. And to say otherwise is hypocritical. And then the last one that we got to last week on the list, the one we're going to start with today, is this. Grace abuse. Grace abuse. Look with me, verses 4 and 5. Or do you think lightly of the riches of God's kindness and tolerance, which means forbearance, and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So, Paul is saying here in verse 4, he's saying, look, God has been good to you. Now, who's the you? Well, they're speaking to the moralists here, but can't we say that he's been good to everybody? That God's been good to all of us? 
And I know he's being accused all the time of not being good. Beloved, do you know the very air we breathe, we breathe because God allows us to breathe it? Do you know the fact that it rains when it needs to and crops grow and we consume those crops? Do you know who's in charge of all that? You know that we, all of the processes, that all the needs, I don't think we under, even fathom how needy we humans are and dependent upon our God. He is good to all of us. And His kindness and His forbearance, His patience, all of these things have a goal. And the goal is to lead us to repentance. That is, we were serving ourselves, worshiping ourselves, doing our own thing. And like the prodigal, we have a change of heart and mind, right? We come to our senses and we say, why am I eating the pig slop of the world? I will turn to my Father. That's the goal of all of God's goodness for us, is to bring us to Christ, to surrender to God through Jesus. Now in verse 5, Paul is telling these moralists, now listen to this, this is very important, that when God's kindness, and when God's forbearance, and when God's patience hit their hearts, what they're doing is they're not repenting of their sin. It says, they have, he says, a stubborn and unrepentant heart. And he says, here's the result of that. Now please listen to this. This is so important. What is the result of the, those who would condemn others, are self-righteous, and they remain in that hypocrisy, they remain in their unrepentance? What's the result of that? Even if it's moral, what's the result? The result is they keep storing up wrath that will ultimately break loose on the final judgment of God. Can you think about that for just a minute and think of the, the gravity of that statement? You know, we kind of arrogantly in this world sort of just flip our hands at God, whatever. And morally, in the, even in the church, we'll say, whatever, God, I, I, you know, I, that's good. Thanks for dying for me and everything, Jesus, but I, I got this. And we just sort of flippantly do that to Him? Do you know there's going to be a day when we're going to see our Creator face to face? And it's not going to be such a flippant day. See, guys, listen. God's grace is profoundly powerful to lead sinners to repentance. But when a sinner resists that grace and does not repent, especially when doing so while holding on to some kind of moral code, it's just storing up a storehouse of guilt. It's piling it up, and it's going to be unleashed in judgment. Now, what Paul mentions here in verse 4 is God's kindness, forbearance, and patience. Do you know what that is? It's grace. It's grace. Do you know, uh, write this down. You've heard me say this before, some of you, but others haven't. Listen. Grace, let's, no, mercy Mercy is God holding back what we do deserve. Mercy is God holding back what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. You follow? Mercy is God holding back what we do deserve. What do we deserve? Hell, ultimately. Grace is God giving us that which we do not deserve. So, none of us deserves God's kindness. None of us deserves uh, for God to be patient with us in our sin. None of us deserves for God to be forbearing. Again, we all deserve hell. But then when we're self-righteous, and we feel like we do deserve those things, we feel like we deserve God's grace, we've earned God's grace, We've earned it by some sort of moral code. We're stepping on His grace. And beloved, that is a very, very bad thing. It's a very dangerous thing to underestimate the value of the grace of God. Oh, and by the way, let me add this. So it works the other way as well. Sometimes people believe wrongly that they're too good for God's grace. But, sometimes people deny God's grace because they think they're too bad for it. Either way, what you're doing is you're putting all of the conditions of giving 
God giving us grace upon ourselves. So we either take advantage of God's grace because we're too good in our minds, or we deny God's grace because we're too bad. And let me say this, and please listen, please hear this. In fact, write this down. Grace is not reliant upon the receiver. Grace is reliant on the giver. Let me say that again. Grace is not reliant on the receiver. Grace is reliant on the giver. No one deserves it, but Jesus died and rose so that we could have it. So when we say, nah, I'm good, or no, I'm, I'm too bad, it do, neither of those matter. Because it's, 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 He did what He did in order to give us what He wants to give us. And all we've got to do is receive. And that's what Paul's point here, though, is in verses 4 and 5, is the longer you take advantage of all that grace, and the longer you refuse to repent, the more wrath you're st uh, storing up for yourselves on Judgment Day. Now, the beauty of God's grace and salvation for those who do repent of their sin, heaven and hell will not be determined by your deeds. That is incredible news, isn't it? Heaven and hell will not be determined on your deeds. There are religions who teach that. So when we talk about the deeds, right? James says that faith without deeds is dead. Well, where do you put the deeds? What he's not saying is, before salvation, the deeds are crucial. No, before salvation, the deeds are meaningless. Our own human stuff is meaningless to save us. After we're saved, now the deeds have power. And the deeds are done by, by Christ through us, and we are His workmanship. But we can't put the deeds before salvation. So for the believer, again, the repentance happens and belief happens. And in so doing, um, heaven and hell was determined already on the cross. And that's great news, isn't it? That's great news. So for the believer on Judgment Day... <laughs> Take heart. Your eternity has already been settled. But for someone who cl simply claims to be a moral person, but who stubbornly refuses to repent, if they refuse, if they believe that until they die, and they refuse to confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that He died for them, God, it says, will render to them accordingly. Look at verse 6. God who will render to each person according to his deeds. That word render means to compensate, to repay, to reimburse. So if a person says to God, nah, no thanks, I'm good, I'm good on my own, look, I, I'm just going to count on my good stuff, you know, to get me into heaven, all good there, thanks Jesus, don't need it, don't need your payment, I'm a good person, I deserve to go to heaven based on my goodness. Well, God's going to say, all right, so person dies, there you go, um, and he's going to say, all right, let's get your life out. Let's look at it. And you lay the whole life down, right? And you're thinking, okay, well, he's just going to kind of pick through there and just see if I'm, you know, good enough to get there on my own. Beloved, that person's not going to even get out of the womb. Because the issue isn't how good, uh, how good, how how tall is your good stack, and how you know does it does it out uh, number the bad stack? It has nothing to do with that. He's going to look for the blood. He's going to look for the blood of the lamb. He's going to look for salvation. Because all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God. No one qualifies for heaven by themselves. And if a person lives their whole life not repenting and believing they're good enough on their own, if they die in that state, God is going to reimburse them accordingly. And no one passes that test. You know, here's the thing. We think that we're going to deny Him, like Romans chapter 1, and pagans, or we deny Him morally. You know, either way, whichever direction you turn there, or whichever path you choose, whether you reject Him overtly or morally, it all leads to the same garbage dump. And that's Paul's point. 
Now, I like this next verse, verse 7, because here Paul is describing the unrepentant heart, but in verse 7, he, re he, re he starts to describe the repentant heart. So check this out. Look at verse 7. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for the glory and honor and immortality, to them eternal life. So I, I love this description because he's, he's, now he's describing the heart of repentance. And, and he's saying these are people who persevere in life through all the ups and downs. And he says, uh, you know, those, that perseverance, it, it's not going to be, uh, man, I've got to get through this life. No, it's going to be persevering and seeking to do good. In other words, we do good things not because we think we have to do it to get us into heaven. We do good things because we want to and because now we have the power to do it in Christ. Not only that, those who repent and persevere, he says they're going to keep looking forward to the glory and the honor, the immortality that God has waiting for us because we have his eternal life. Look down at verse 10. Here's more of this uh, description of the repentant heart. He says, But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good. That is, who has a repentant heart. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now here again, what will God render to those who do repent of their sin and believe in Jesus? Glory, honor, peace. Those are the deeds of the repentant heart. The ones who believe in Jesus. They will persevere in life they will live for God's glory and honor. They will, they're living with a heavenly perspective, and they're receiving from God that which they give unto God. So think about this. We live for His glory. What does He give back to us in return? Glory. We, live for his, we seek God's honor. What does He give back to us, His children? He gives us honor. We seek the heavenly things. What does God give back to us? He gives us peace. But then in verses 8 and 9, he goes back to the unrepentant heart. And here he shows us the results of dying in unrepentance. Look at verse 8. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, first for the Jew, uh, also for the Greek. Again, uh, Paul is saying... It doesn't matter if you are moral about it. Um, it's leading to the same junk. And guys, moralists that Paul is writing to here, for generations after, there are people who have been attending Christian churches like they are here in Rome. And there are some people who call themselves Christians and who attend those Christian churches and are part of those bodies. And Paul is telling them, in spite of what you portray, you who call yourselves Christians, underneath, if you still refuse to repent and truly believe, it's not good enough. And he describes those people. He describes the professing Christian. He says that they're selfishly ambitious. What does that mean? That means they're self-seeking. So in other words, they're just wrapped up in themselves. They're wrapped up in what they're doing. They're wrapped up all wrapped up in what they need. And the needs of others aren't really their concern unless the needs of others meet their own needs. Selfishly ambitious. He says they don't obey the truth. And I find this one interesting because that's the same thing Paul told the pagans in chapter 1. Right? He, he says they suppress the truth and they exchange the truth of God for a lie. But now he's telling the moralists, you deny the truth also. You don't obey the truth also. Again, it looks moral. It looks like you are on the outside, but in your hearts, you haven't submitted to the truth. And look, it doesn't matter how it looks. If, if people deny God, uh, they're not interested in what God says or what God wants. They're only interested in what they want. And that's the great equalizer. Again, whether you reject God as a pagan or as a moralist, they might look different, but they all lead to the same place. And that is, he says, you obey unrighteousness. You know, it might have a Christian veneer over it, but it still leads to the same place. Now, guys, listen. I, I, uh, I look at this portion of chapter 2, and uh, a lot of things come to mind, but there's something that I really want to um, kind of end this message with. And I'd like everybody, if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 13. 
So turn your Bibles to the left, to the first book of the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we're going to start in verse 24. Let me say this before I start reading. I see something in the life of this, in this parable and what we read in Romans there, Romans 2. We've got to be very, very aware of something. Now, I do want to say this before I begin. As your pastor, I, don't, I really don't lose sleep about you guys in, in, in so far as salvation. I don't worry about people in this body insofar as salvation. Okay, now I'm not saying that maybe the Lord has told you something in this message. Maybe he's convicted your heart. And I would never want to, you know, short circuit that. Okay, so if God is convicting you of something this morning, praise God, go with that. But I'm just saying, I have pastored other churches in the past and I have worried about their salvation. I've, I've worried about them being pretenders. Okay, but I don't worry about that in this body. That said... It's a harsh reality, and that is this. Among the church, there are wheat and there are tares. And this is the way it's going to be as long as there's church on this side of eternity. There is wheat and there's the tares. Look with me in Matthew 13, verse 24. Jesus is sharing a parable. He says, he presented another parable to them. Who's the them? Well, back in verse 10, he says, the disciples came to him. So he's talking to his disciples here. And he says, here's the parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. So let's pause right there for a second. What's a tear? Uh, a tear, and the one that he's describing here, also known as a, a darnel seed. But a tear um, is a weed. But it looks, especially in its early stages of growth, it looks just like wheat. Now, when it grows a little more, and then a little more, it becomes evident that it's not wheat, it's a weed. And that's what he says here, the tares became evident. So, a tear looks like wheat, uh, wheat, but it's actually a weed, and it can be distinguished from the wheat when it's fully ripe. And by the way, this particular uh, weed, what it seeks is to try to uproot the wheat. So tares are selfishly ambitious. Let's keep reading. Verse 27. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And the master said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? In other words, you want us to pull those weeds? Verse 29. But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Here's verse 30. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them up. Then I will gather the wheat into my barn. Okay. This is a parable game where he's, Jesus is telling us this story to point out that there are people in the church who have infiltrated our ranks. In fact, it says the enemy came and put them there. He strategically places tares among the wheat. He places the moralists, the unrepentant moralists, in our midst. You know, think about that. So, we've had church experiences where you're sitting side by side. Wheat and tares sitting side by side in church services. Breathing the same air. Listening to the same sermon. Singing the same worship songs. And this is, gonna ha this is how it's going to be until the Lord returns. Notice, the Master said, though, because they're asking Him, well, then let's pull the weeds, right? That's what we got to do. we got to pull them suckers out. He says, no way. No, you can't do that, because if we do that... You're going to uproot the wheat also. 
He says, I'll deal with the tares at Judgment Day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they're going to be bundled up and they're going to burn. You know what that means? Hell. Hell. It says, but the wheat, I'm taking them to my barn. What's that represent? Heaven. Home. Guys, the enemy has infiltrated the Lord's ranks. And that, that, that's not a new thing. Isn't that what happened in the Garden of Eden? The serpent infiltrated the ranks? You know, even among Jesus' own disciples, there was a Judas. Right, a Judas Iscariot. In the early church, he had Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I would say that all of those I just listed, they're wolves. All right, they're wolves. And I think the difference between a tear and a wolf, a wolf knows they're a tear. They have an agenda, right? I don't think tares necessarily know they're tares sometimes. Um, and that, by the way, that, I've said this before, that is my greatest fear, is that there will be people in my care, under my shepherding, that think they're Christians, but they're not. I would much rather have somebody who just overtly rejects Christ, and I know it, <laughs> than having them unknowingly reject Christ. But oftentimes, let me tell you this. This is really important, gang. Oftentimes the tares can be in church leadership. Oftentimes they can lead ministries. They can even be pastors. And eventually you'll see it. Why? Well, what do you say in Romans 2? Verse 8. Selfish ambition. Um, now, Clearly our job is not to pull the weeds. Because we do that, the weed is hurt also. I do think there's room for wolves. There's Matthew 18 that says you deal with the wolves this way. Church discipline. Okay, We're talking about tares. What do we do? What do we do? Well, here's how I want to close the message. I think, first of all, we need to praise God that passages like Romans 2 and Matthew 13 are in the Bible. <laughs> I think it's so cool of God to be honest with us about this, don't you? I mean, He's going he's gonna to be honest. He's going to point out hypocrisy and selfishness. He's going to point out terrorism, T-A-R-E-ism. The wheat must be aware that the evil one has planted tares among us. And I'm not just talking about the body. I'm saying the church, right? You, all of us interact with people who say they're Christians. All of us do. But the, the enemy's planted them. Why? Well, he's trying to water down the word. And he's trying to harm the people of God. He's trying to bring down the witness of God and Christ. So we've got to be quick. And I, I especially will say we've got to be quick when it's in leadership. There's got to be accountability. And I think we've got to go slow in raising up leaders in our church body. But more than anything, I think this is what we need to do. We've got to make sure that we are not the hypocrites ourselves. Did you notice in the parable, when did the tares become evident? When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, right? Fruit. What's the best way to tell if a dollar bill is counterfeit? When you stick it next to a real dollar bill. Right? Yeah. What's the best way to know a tear? Stick it right next to a wheat and compare the two. And that's what we do. We're not going to go around aggressively accusing people of being tares. We can't see their hearts. We can't see their fruit or the lack thereof. Can we not? And we can be the wheat that God has made us to be. So we don't judge people. We don't condemn people. We don't feel like we're better than other people. That's what Paul's warning us about, right? We don't do that. What we do is we cling even more. You know, here, check this out. Wheat and tares, right? The real deal. Do you know when a wheat starts to bear fruit or bear grain? You know what happens to it? It gets heavy at the top. And then it does this. It bows. It bends or it bows. A tear doesn't bear grain, doesn't bear fruit. So guess what it does? It doesn't bow. Beloved, tears don't truly submit to God. The wheat does that. The wheat bows. The tear stands straight up. 
Now, they may look like they do on the outside, but not in their hearts. God's people submit. Let me tell you something. God's people live their lives on their knees before the throne. They're not pretending to be perfect, but they're clinging to Jesus with all they got. The wheat don't attempt to put themselves on the throne. You know, the wheat wants to grant forgiveness. The wheat wants to seek forgiveness rather than always making excuses for why they hurt somebody. The wheat wants to encourage people and help them rather than use people for their own selfish gain. The wheat wants to repent of their sins and rather than taking advantage of God's grace, they're so grateful for God's grace. You can see the difference. It will come out eventually. So what do we do? Let's be the wheat that we are in Christ. And hopefully, the tares will be exposed. And I'll tell you this. Hopefully, finally, the tares will repent. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, as we close today, I just pray that these words would somewhere, somehow grab hold and take root in someone's heart. Lord, encourage us, those who are the wheat. We're not the wheat because we did it. God, we're your people because of what you did. God, when you held out your hand in salvation, Lord, our belief in you is what reached out and grabbed hold of it. And there was this beautiful union of lightness of heart. And God, from that point, we see the miracle of salvation unleashed in our lives and from our lives onto the lives of others. God, help us to remember that is what we are in you. We have the power to live in Christ. That our deeds didn't save us, but our deeds bring you glory and they expose who we are. Lord, for the tares, I pray. God, we know that the evil one has planted them, but Lord, I pray that even those tares, the moralists, all the other people we're going to look at and hear in Romans 2 and 3, God, that you would help us to be such a, a shining testimony, a witness, not perfect. In fact, in our failure, we could be witnesses. But God, I pray that as we live for you and the power of Christ shines through us, I pray that the tares would wake up to the reality that that, that is who they are. They are a tear. And that they repent. They come to their senses. And Lord, that they would experience salvation in Christ. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.